Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good morning. Uh, already, I told made a, a, a good CV for me, even though I'm a bit young to have that kind of background, but I'll try to do, and we try to do our best with regard to analyzing the political um, activities and religion as part of the identity of the Balkan people and uh, communities. Uh, Professor Agundus, director of the IUR, dear professors from abroad, uh, students, friends, colleagues, I'm very much delighted to be here with you, and uh, it's my first visit in Holland, although I have been into some other European countries, but this is my first visit, and I thank you very much for this opportunity and the, uh, the uh, environment and space. Uh, what I would like to do in my 25 or 30 minutes is to uh, just to give certain insights about the Balkan politics. I don't know how much uh, you know the Balkans as a, as a region, but I'll try to do my best in, as a snapshot to give you the insights of the political dynamisms and how religion has been used or misused by the political leadership that made Balkans very complex and also a synonym for instability and insecurity. So when we speak today about the Balkans, uh, I think the majority of us, we think on uh, in, in, for a region that is very much insane. But before going to that, uh, I think that this, we talk about religion, I think that religion is a very uh, complex uh, foundation basics on philosophical, legal, and also um, understanding of God that also implicated uh, lots of scholarship with regard to to the uh, social sciences, politics, economy, and so on and so forth. In this context, I would like to say that religion played always an, an important role because before having these the ideas of nation or nation states and, and ideas of national uh, identification, I think people had this, had the understanding of being uh, part of a certain re religion, and though the context of atheism was very much less, less involved because they had no chance to be called, as they do call today as being atheist with regard to their uh, opinion. So this, this public space of uh, speaking about that uh, somebody does not trust and does not believe God is, is irreligious was very much, you know, uh, conserved and you go towards towards certain uh, marginalization and also you have the uh, bearing loss of uh, consequences. Uh, in this in this context, what we can find with regard to religions is that um, I think Christianity now is much in a better position because uh, the selection of of the of the readings always go with regard to the New Testament, for which I think Islam is much in a complex way because you know when you read Quran you read as a whole construction. And what Christianity is in much advanced performance, at least for the politicians, that they always try to cite the New Testament, which is much more flexible, understandable, and gives you an opportunity to, to come along with the human right positions, what the Western world is trying to advocate nowadays. While Islam goes in this you know, unity, and you can find out verses, you can bring misinterpretation, and then here you go, you find new communities that it's very hard to, you know, uh, in a way, discuss with them, debate, and then of, of course media tries to pick up, and then it gives you a whole picture about Islam in the in the in the in the whole world, unfortunately. But you will find uh, positive and negative, which I agree with Professor Heidi, in the context of finding examples. For instance, just go back to the Thomas Aquinas and Aurelius Augustine. You'll find the just war theory. Christianity was the one that gave a justification to fight against, let's say, Islam in the Middle East. Uh, those that go and fight Muslims, if they are alive, they will get the benefits of, the, of the, today's world. But those that die, they will have the benefits of the, you know, the world of, of, of heaven. So justification, if we would like to go historically, it comes from the Christian world, not from the Islamic world. I'm not trying to justify the Muslims, but you know, to be fair enough, historically we have this evidence. Uh, if we talk about political integration, just go and read the Treaty of Medina, an incredible document that Magna Carta Libertatum of Britain was really late when it comes to human rights and political rights. Medina goes on a full scale of integration that today's Germany you know, failed, I think. Medina succeeded in, uh, in the seventh century. But what we did actually as a Muslim community, we went so back and backward it so that we have completely lost the context of these documentations and we try to struggle under a new uh, political environment, unfortunately. Uh, the Western world, even though I don't want to use this, because what is West for me, it might be East, you know. 
uh, this geographical context is very much manipulative. But then I'm going to use West because everybody uses West, meaning the Western Europe. Is that Europe passed into some uh, political dynamism that I think the Muslim world didn't. And also the Balkans here is involved. Because you don't have the Cromwell evolution of the political system in Britain. You don't find this in the Muslim world. You don't find the French Revolution of 1789. You don't find the industrialization process. I think these three mega, mega projects involved the issue, on one hand, secularism or laicism in France, as they would like to call it. And it's something that is unknown for the Muslim world. And I think we are not compatible and we are not comparable in this, in this, in this context. So Balkans, from which I come, I'm Albanian, from Macedonia and as an ethnicity, because in the Balkans we'd like to give more priority to ethnicities rather to state identities. We, don't, we never had this melting pot of full integration. Therefore, in this, in this context, uh, I would like to say that the Balkans, because we were part of the Ottoman Empire, we never uh, succeeded to have this capitalistic movement or the movement of capitalism, which we are you know, falling behind, even though we are Europeans as a region, but we never faced that moment of you know, um, formation of the new bourgeoisie, which is going to be involved politically, on one hand changing the political system from monarchism to constitutional monarchism, if you will, and also completely taking out religion from political and public space, which is the case of France. The case of Britain, the case of Britain is much more soft, I think, because of the House of Lords, they allowed the bishopry and the, the, the church to play quite much, but not very much in the decision-making uh, process. The people of the Balkans never faced this. So what we face is that we faced the moment of religion to continue to become the basics of the national identification. Once the Ottoman uh, Empire dissolved itself, we have the very beginning of the Balkan Wars, 1912, and it's also the, let's say, the continuation of the First World War, 1914, 1918. So the Balkan people, once the Ottomans completely left us as a mechanism, and I don't want to use the term conqueror, neither for the Ottomans, neither for the Romans, neither for the, for the Byzantines, because, you know, at that time, uh, if they were not, we would have had uh, mechanism or management scale of those societies. As Max Weber says, the Ottomans never came to the Balkans because of their fight and you know, jihad with warfare, but they came because of their social, economical, and political changes that Europe had nothing uh, at, that, at that moment. So uh, in this context, we, the people of the Balkan, uh, although in, in the Balkans actually um, used, and still we use religion, as part of our, uh, let's say, national and political identity, if you will, later on. And in this, in this case, we are quite different than the Western Europe, uh, willingly or unwillingly. And this made us very much complex, uh, in a sense of positivism, but also it made us very much in negative context, looking at the 1990s, when the second Yugoslavia, Tito, started to dissolve itself. We have lots of conflicts in, amongst us, and the religious, discourse was actually uh, seen as, as, as the, the frontier. So in, in, this, in, this, in this case, what I can give you some insights about religion and politics altogether is that uh, uh, when the Ottomans actually came for the first time before going to or uh, you know, being part of Istanbul from the, in the 15th century, they were actually in the, in the Balkan part. So uh, I believe you know the Kosovo battle, 1389, is the 14th century the Ottomans for the first time with the Serbian Empire actually clashed. Uh, it's, it's a clash, it's a war, and it, it, it has lots of you know, multiple uh, consequences. The first consequence is that they have stopped the Serbianization or Slavianization of the Balkans because the Tsar Lazar had this position being granted by Vatican to, on one hand, to Christianize the people of the Balkans. And you have to know that in the Balkans you have Slavs, you have Albanians, which are coming from the Illyrians, and you have also Greeks. We are quite different on religious and also on, uh, let's say, um, ethnical positions and linguistic positions. So it's a complexity of a very small uh, region. So what happened in the 14th century is the first uh, common ground of this religious, let's say, uh, warfare, but it implicated many things. So if you see the perspective from a Serbian point of view, the Ottomans coming to manage with the Balkans and with the whole region is something which is wrong, 
because they have invaded the Balkans or invaded Europe, if you will. And also they have stopped the Christianization model in the Balkans. But if you ask the Albanians specifically, because we are in majority we are Muslims, we say no, actually the Ottomans that came and had this battle, it's something very positive. First, they brought economical, political, and social uh, changes, infrastructure, logistics, um, interconnection, a certain globalization from the Silk Road uh, and Via Ignatia. And also, it stopped the process of Slavianization and Christianization of the Albanians, which were, by the way, some of them were in, in minority Catholics, and most of them were pagans. So uh, it depends how you see the perspective. If you see from the Albanian point of view, actually the national identity of Albanians that remained is because of the uh, existence and representation of the Ottoman Empire that brought the possibility of you know, controlling, managing the territories, but never touching on the context of religion, like Raif Dean. So we are here in a sense of political management. We don't touch your religion. Now, an argument for this, historical argument, is that from the Balkan people, the only those that became Muslims are Albanians in majority, because in Albania you have around 65% of Muslims. Kosovo, Macedonia are full. I can say 99% to 95% uh, Muslims. And the question is that the rest remained. Slovenians and Croats remained Catholics. Serbs, Montenegrins remained uh, Orthodox Christians. Greeks remained, Bulgarians remained, and so on, Romanians, and so on and so forth. So this is a very strong argument that the Ottomans had no intention to actually assimilate the communities into the Islam, coming from Christianity to Islam. So it, it, it gives you a good argument that this uh, political mechanism of Ottomans was actually most, mostly about managing the communities, rather you know, imposing um, uh, with, by force and with force the context of Islam. So why Albanians and Bosniaks or Bosnians, which I, I forgot to mention, became Muslims is because of the issue of understanding Islam, and it's not because of the benefits that some uh, Orientalists would like to mention the idea. It's because uh, I will give you plenty of arguments about this. I'm not trying to defend Islam against Christianity, but I'm trying to bring, to bring some historical facts and arguments. First is that Christianity in the Balkans came under the process of Slavianization. So today, if you go to Macedonia, and you find and you meet Albanian Christians in Macedonia, they're not anymore Albanians. They feel themselves Macedonians. Mm. So alongside with Christianity, they actually shifted towards Slavianism. So you have shifted and you have lost the first you know, ethical identity for religious uh, matters. While with regard to Islam, the Bosniaks and the, and the Albanians remain what they are ethnically. No change in language, no change in their customs, traditions, and uh, culture. But of course, they have had benefits with regard to the issue of taxation. No Jizya, but they paid almsgiving, you know, 2.5%. Uh, and by the way, if, if you ask me what, what was the best position, I think non-Muslims had much better position because of 10%, because you got security of your wealth, goods, you know, um, culture, religion, and writings, public speeches, and so on and so forth, which the Muslims had uh, not very much in this position. Just look, see the Muslim Turks in Cyprus. You know, in the 15th century, the Christians in Cyprus had the right to print their, you know, Christian pamphlets, while the Muslim, because of the Hanafi tradition, which was completely wrong, because Hanafism goes towards rationality. I don't know how they have interpreted this, but Muslim couldn't do that, because it might be, you know, something new. It might be, you know, uh, new and you don't have to use that. So therefore, the non-Muslims had a very good benefit, which I think today we pay, you know, that 10%, just compare it, which it's uncomparable, of course, from today's point of view, but just to be a bit funny, we pay more than 50% of taxation and we get, we, we get no security at all in today's Europe, if you will. Well, people pay 10% of their jizya and they had full scale of uh, logistics from the, from the state and so on and so forth. So the case of Kosovo became, to come back to this historical evidence, became a momentum. And what the Muslims actually were facing is that they had benefit until 1912. The moment when Ottoman Empire dissolved itself, um, Muslims paid a great price. And this you can find in the books of Trotsky. You can find in the Carnage Endowment of International Peace that in 1912, when the Balkan War starts, full villages in Kosovo and in Bosnia were put into fire from the Serbian communities 
under the identity that they are Muslims, and these Muslims were actually enslaved us for 500 years. So the, pay, the price to be paid, were paid was paid actually quite much in these years until the end of the First World War from the side of Albanians and the Bosnians, which were Muslims by identity. This is the second argumentation that if it was about you know, Albanians and Bosnians to become Muslim fully because of benefits, in 1912 we said, look, it was manipulation, we wanted them because of the benefits. And they would have said, okay, we go back to our previous religion. No, they stood and actually because they accept, accepted the, the monotheism or the understanding of Islam, the Tawheed, as it is. So you pay the prices and the Serbian involvement, and this is, by the way, it's argumented by Trotsky. Trotsky, it's, uh, I believe you know, it's uh, one of the most important political communist leaders of Soviet Union. Therefore, it's not an emotionality. It's quite rational historical evidence that he says full villages of Muslims, Albanians and Bosnians, were put into fire as a response and as a consequence of what they have done. They have been you know, unified with the Ottomans in these uh, 450 50 years. So the Balkans once again started to, you know, in a way, misuse religion, unfortunately. And in this, in this context, you find out a new, let's say, a new track tour of the Green Transvaal, which goes from Turkey and enters to the Bulgaria with regard to Pomax, Albanians in Macedonia, Albania with Albanians, Kosovo, Bosnia. This is the Green, green Transvaal, which the, the Serbs and Orientalists was, were misusing during 1992 when the war between Serbs and Bosnia was existing, and saying to Americans that don't, you don't have to intervene, because if you're intervening, you're going to create Alice Begovic state, which is an Islamic state. And do you want to have an Islamic state in the heart of Europe? You don't want it, so please don't do this. And if you see from international, because I teach also international relations, you'll find out a very interesting fact. 92 America, with regard to Clinton's administration, was saying that we are not the world's police, and we are not going to intervene. By the way, what's, hap what's, what's happening in the world? It's not only the Balkans. You have the Caucasus, with regard to Azerbaijan and Armenia, with Nagorno Karabakh. You have also the case of the Africa of Rwanda and so on and so forth. But in '95, something happened, which completely changed the ideas of we call it humanitarian interventionism, where you have the civilians a part of, of states. So state sovereignty is not any more important. Rather, the sovereignty of people is much more important. And uh, in this context. I think this challenge or this, this antagonism between Christianity and Islam in the Balkans continues to go uh, because of, first, territories and political, political reasons. So if you enter into the debate of communities, the Balkans, and I was astonished when uh, the, the, our friend from America yesterday was talking about that she was, in a way, house imprisoned when 2001 happened. We never faced this in the Balkans. If you have this case, it means you have ethnic conflict. And I was amazed that you talk about America, which we refer to the states as one of the most democratic societies, and you have been imprisoned because of your identity. I think something is wrong here, either with regard to political culture, either with regard to the political leadership, or with insecurity. It means that police and the justice system is not functioning, and because you have been deprived to, from your right to go away. So in the Balkans, we never had this problem. When the war started, it means we have an ethnic war, and you, have, you use that animality within you. And uh, you know, if you're a Muslim, you try to protect your family and household because the Bosniaks first had no position to prevent themselves because they had no geographical scale from which they will get, uh, let's say, help, as the Croats had from Germans and Austrians. Uh, the Bosnians remained in a very bad position. This is not because of me, be this is because of the consequences. So I try not to be very emotional on the Muslims. 150,000 people died in three years under the issue that you are a Muslim. So the Serbs were, were not calling the Bosnians as Bosnians, but they were calling them as Dahia. I don't know whether you know this term. Dahia actually, it's an old Ottoman term, a notion for a warrior for Ottoman warrior. So they were saying, look, if you kill a Muslim family in times of insecurity, you are not killing a, actually a Bosniak or a Bosnian, which is a general term for all the Bosnians living in Bosnia, but you are killing actually a, a Dahia, an Ottoman warrior, which was enslaving us. Of course, to be quite honest, not all the Serb Serbian community was using this, uh, but the political elite and the military elite of the Chetniks was using under the provision of uh, Radovan Karadzic and, and 
general knowledge. They were actually imposing this. But what the Serbian people should do is that Serbian people should apologize as the German community apologized to the Jewish community. Not all the Germans were part of SS and SA you know, combatants, but at least because of the Jewish issues, the German political elite uh, apologized. And I think the Serbs are quite, you know, in a very much unstable situation in this. So I'm not trying to say that all the Serbs had this position, but in a way they accepted them. And they have tolerated Milosevic together with Mladic and Jinjic, sorry, and Karadzic in Bosnia to execute the Muslims only because they are Muslims. So, uh, but there is another side of the coin. In Bosnia, during Yugoslavian time, not to be very negative, the, the integration w went so fast and advanced so that Muslim women and Muslim men actually had mixed marriages with Serbs. So from 1945, when the second Yugoslavia arose, which is under Tito's Yugoslavia, the position of ethnicities and the position of religion became actually uh, submitted as secondary, not very important, but the new artificial context or concept of Yugoslavianism became important. So we are brothers and sisters because of the socialism, because of Yugoslavia, not because of you know, Islam and Christianity and so on and so forth. So you have to forget a bit that context and you go towards this. So under this, I think if you see all the states, Slovenia, Croatia, by the way, we have many states in the Western Balkans because of the dissolution of Yugoslavia, Montenegro, Macedonia, Kosovo, uh, and Bosnia and Herzegovina. You will get that the Muslims believed much more in the dream of Yugoslavia rather than the Christians. <laughs> the Muslims actually advanced and they have lots of mixed marriages with Serbs. And by the way, they never use this, this condition, which is in the, in the thick category that a Muslim man can marry with a non-Muslim woman and a Muslim woman should, can get married with a non-Muslim, but only if he you know, becomes a Muslim at the, in the day of marriage. I think you will find I mean, there are statistics which Muslim women actually got married with non-Muslims, and they continue to live in that kind of diversified marriage. But 92, 95 completely cracked that you know, delusion, I can say. And afterwards, you find a, a bit of separation to this context. I don't know what's, what's the case of my time, but in this in this moment comes the name of Dr. Aliz Begovic. Have you heard about him? I believe so, because Turks are very emotional to Bosniaks, to Bosniaks and they try to give this idea of Aliz Begovic. Aliz Begovic is one of the most important political figures that wanted to impose religious identity before this Yugoslavianism. And therefore, he was actually imprisoned. And I don't know whether you have read his works. The first document is the uh, the Declaration of Islam, Islamska Deklaratia. It's also in, translated into English and many other languages. And the, uh, the other book, which is very much important, is Islam between the West and East. And he tries to give, he tries to compare this issue, whether Islam is new to Europe. And he gives the arguments of Ibn Rush, Ibn Sina, that no, the humanism and Renaissance comes because of Muslims and so on and so forth. Uh, so, uh, I think that I'm, I'm quite in, in five minutes, I believe so. Uh, religion also is something that uh, remained very, as, as a puzzle in the case of Balkans. Just look at the communist Albania, which, is, which was not part of Yugoslavia. It's a time of 1944 to 1985. It's a time of Enver Hoxha, uh, a very um, cruel totalitarian regime of communism. And uh, by the way, he was coming from a Muslim background but he was indoctrinated under the communistic ideology. And from 1967, Albania uh, was, a com it's, it was the most atheist country in the world. No Islam, no Christianity, no Judaism, no nothing was existing in Albania from 1967 to 1990s. 23 years, a total you know, blackout, and it was imposed by communism. In Yugoslavia, in general, without entering into peculiar cases, we had a more soft case because we were introduced under the context of self-management, samopravlenia. And um, you could be a religious man until you don't, you're not involved into politics. So you can go to pray, so it's the concept of secularism. In civil society, do whatever you want. But if you implicate your religious you know, identification to political life, then you are being stopped. Where Azbegovic has been stopped, he has been imprisoned a couple of times with more than 15 years. So in Yugoslavia, if you want to be a, a good man, if you are a peasant, if you are uh, working in a factory, 
And if you, if you go to pray, if you fast, if you do your weddings under the Islamic, let's say, customs, no problems. Yugoslavia, at least from 1970s, touches you, I mean, not. But if you implicate into political life, then there is a big, 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 big wall. So that this, in the, this is the case of in the, in the whole Yugoslavian position. But we have to be honest and to see the political dynamisms of the Croats under the Hadeze, which means this, that the Catholic Church actually played a huge role to implicate uh, the political independence of Croats from Yugoslavia. The Christian Church, Orthodox Church, helped the Serbian identity of the Chetniks to impose towards its independency and created Milosevic as one of the most charismatic leaders for them, not for the world, but for them it's one of the most important. And in, 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 this, in this case, I think that religion once again started to arose. So there is no religion, but there is church, we can, we can say, at least in the case of Christians. So religion has been, in a way, secondary or tertiary, but church remained as one of the most important factors. And I say this, it's because even today, not just in times of war, because in times of Dayton Agreement, before having Dayton Agreement, I'm sorry for going to this information, but it's very important to see that when the Americans, Holbrook, wanted not to talk with Mladic and, and, and Karadzic because they were emotional, he said, okay, I would like to talk to Milosevic. Because Milosevic was the president of Serbia, not of Bosnia. He said, you are in the name of, Bos of, of the Serbs in Bosnia, we'll talk. So come and talk with you, you're more pragmatic. What happened? Milosevic couldn't come and talk to Americans for peace and stability in Bosnia unless the bishop of the church came and said, okay, you are blessed to talk in the names of Serbs of Bosnia. So this element of, you know, the church that is in symphonia with the state affairs still remains. So that's why I say we never have a clear secularistic approach to the state affairs and civil society, religious, religious affairs. The same thing is in Greece even though it's part of the European Union. You just go and see when the Prime Minister becomes elected, there is also always a priest to come there. Though America has this quite, quite much in the context of political um, establishment. Uh, in the case of Albanians, and I will stop here, we don't have this. Unfortunately, we don't have this because from the 1950s, communism completely changed the historical um, interpretation and Albanians, and I say I'm unfortunate, unfortunate this because I, I, I teach Balkan politics. Today in the relationship with Turkey we have lots of problems, to be honest, because when you read our historical books, what communists has done and what communism did in these 40 years completely changed the Albanian independence war and made Turks, meaning the Ottomans, but, you know, as, as legacy, made Turks as the biggest enemy of Albanians. And today we, the new academia, we're trying to strive to find out new arguments, and which we have the arguments, look at the viziers, look at the unity and so on and so forth, but we are in a big struggle to explain that no, it's not true. We might have had problems with Ottomans in the late time, with the John Turks and others, but the biggest enemy for Albanians, historically from the 13th century and until 1998 with the Kosovo War, you know, are the Serbs. I'm not trying to give this religious context, but from an ethical point of view, it's true that Albanians always had a struggle for its independency from the frame of Serbs. Why? Because Serbs are not willing to have Kosovo as a region, but because the whole Christian identity of Serbs is in Kosovo. The old monasteries, the whole culture, and so on and so forth. So by, by seceding Kosovo from Serbia, actually, it's not because of territory. It's because of the religious identity of Serbs, once again. And this battle continues to, to, be, to be done because of this Kosovo's independency and so on and so forth. So to, to, in a way to sum up, let me just give you some ideas of the Muslims of, of the West, and I'm sorry for, for my time. Um, uh, first, the Muslims in the Balkans, it seems to me we are autochthonous. And that's why we, we are fully established as humans in the Balkans and as individuals, as citizens. The, the, the case of West, Western Europe with regard to Muslims, it seems to me it's, it, it has to be looked on the question of emigration. Most of the Muslims came actually to West. And by coming and by emigrating, it means that you have to go through that process of, of you know, integration, or as they call it, full assimilation, for which they failed, in a sense of, you know, with regard to education and, and language issues and so on and so forth. But uh, generally, what we have to say is that um, we have also to, to speak about this debate between Islam and Christianity, if, if, if I'm allowed so. In Judaism, it's a bit of, 
you know, in slow motion and it's like, you know, in stand, standby motion, even though I think it's completely involved in the problem in the context of, or in, in, the, in the whole picture, I think it's 2001. And 2001 completely, you know, challenged the academia, the, the, the scholars, the imams, and so on and so forth. And we try to justify ourselves that we are Muslims. By the way, Islam is not very new for America. And I was shocked, you know, from the 16th, 17th century, you find Muslims in America. And in this context, I think that the political leadership is completely, you know, violating the position to misinterpret the Islam and Muslims in the West, specifically in America, if you will. Because, to be honest, the American legislation intervenes in European legislation. Just look at ISIS. From 2011, I see this from political reason, many Albanians went to Syria to fight for their position. And at the time, America was supporting the Syrian opposition, you know. And they were also motivating people to go there to actually, to, uh, in a way, help to uh, change the Assad's, Assad's regime. But when ISIS actually emerged, totally, you know, re-challenged, reconstructed the international politics, Turkish position, if you will, American position, so on and so forth. What happened? In two months, when America said that ISIS is, you know, the wrongdoer, there is a European legislation that comes even to Balkans so that if you go to Syria, no matter in which position you are, whether you are with opposition, whether with Jabhat al-Nusra, whether with ISIS, you have to be imprisoned when you come back. So the American security position, because of NATO, it's always, you know, uh, in a way, you know, impacting the European legislation. And I think in this context, we have to be very much, you know, cautious, not in a sense cautious of repercussion, but in a sense of understanding that American legislation is always, you know, uh, in hand to hand to European legislation, and, and Balkan people always, you know, are facing this this position. Uh, the last, I think that Muslims, unfortunately, as a critique to ourselves, we haven't changed our position from Muhammad Abdus time, when he said, "I have seen Europe, and I've seen lots of Muslims, but I've seen no Islam in Europe." You know, when he made that trip, and when he went to Egypt, his pupils and students asked him, "Our teacher, what you have seen in Europe?" It's late 19, beginning of the 20th century. He said, I have been to Europe, I have seen Muslims. Uh, I'm sorry, I've seen Islam, but no Muslims. I came back to our country, I see Muslims, but I see no Islam. In the context of justice, stability, uh, let's say, distribution of wealth, corruption, and so on and so forth. Thank you very much for your time. I think we, we, we might have also time for questions and answers. Thank you very much.